Hello and welcome to the next part of my Repairathon. Today I'm going to talk about this 386 mainboard. In the introduction video it was the one of the two mainboards with the heavy oxidation as a result of a leaky battery. In the introduction video I removed the leaky battery and used some white vinegar to neutralize the battery electrolytes. Uh, by the way, some viewers asked again which concentration of the vinegar I use and it can be everything from 3 to 15 percent, but be careful. The job of the vinegar is to neutralize the electrolytes, but if the concentration is too high, it will start to attack the copper traces if you uh, let it there for too long. You will have to work faster and wash the board with some water as soon as possible. If you are not sure, take something around 5% and if you want to know more about this topic, watch my video about why we use vinegar to clean the electrolyte damage. So, after I used the vinegar, I washed the board properly with a lot of water and some soap. And after a couple of days of drying, the board is ready to be repaired. The board is a shuttle hot 317h by the way ultimate retro project was merged with the retro web and is now located under the new address theretroweb.com the site looks still very similar and the old links should work and been redirected to the new address but you probably should update your favorites so shuttle hot 317h a very nice and tiny 3d6 board with an opti chipset let's see what we have the damage from the battery doesn't look too bad, to be honest. I can clearly see some damaged traces, but it is unclear if they are completely gone or can be still rescued. I will have to remove some parts, including the keyboard port, to see our today's battlefield properly. I pulled the two cache ICs from the sockets and I don't see any damage under them. Everything looks really clean, so I think that I will not remove the sockets for now. It doesn't look necessary and maybe there is no reason to stress the PCB more than required. On the back everything looks very clean as well. As you can see, the solder joints of the cache sockets are looking shiny compared to some of them near the edge, which were affected by the electrolyte. So my assumption that under the cache sockets is probably everything okay could be true. So far, I'll add some dioxide and put the ICs back into the sockets. The board looks otherwise very good, and there are just some bent pins. Ok, time to remove some parts. The bad thing about the leaky battery is not only that it dissolves the copper traces, but also that the solder gets oxidized and is quite hard to remove. So you need a couple of rounds to make it. Just be patient and add fresh solder, soak, add more solder and try again. Also bending the pins and scratching the solder joints a little bit can help a lot. So, I removed everything I considered to be in the way, and now the damage is better visible than before. First of all, I'll polish away the solder mask and the rest of the oxidation to get a shiny copper traces again, where I can solder some wires if needed. For the polishing I either use a fiberglass pencil or such polishing tips with a Dremel tool. The fiberglass pencil works good, you can work slowly and have good control over the whole process. But on the other hand, it takes more time and it leaves a lot of teeny tiny glass needles all over the place, which then stuck in your fingers and hurt badly. That's why I don't like to work with a fiberglass pencil and instead prefer the polishing tips. I bought such a set for 10 or maybe 15 euro and I guess it should be enough for the whole lifespan of this channel. These green tips are not made of ceramic like this one. It is hard and using it would most likely instantly damage the PCB and rip off the traces, so don't use it. 
These green tips are a little bit softer, and I guess it is a mix of rubber and a very fine sand, so it is much more gentle to the PCB. I always use such tips to polish away the solder mask and clean the copper surface from the oxide. Should you want to try it, take some useless hardware and practice a little bit. It needs a little bit more experience than for the fiberglass pencil, but once you develop a feeling, you can work a lot faster and without the pesky fiberglass needles. Yeah, there are definitely a couple of broken traces around the keyboard port. Usual victims of a leaky battery. Also on the back there is some visible damage and oxide which has to be cleaned. Okay, the damage on this board turned out to be more devious on the second side. Beside of the obvious oxidation, where parts of the traces vanished completely, there are also some traces which do look fine, but have probably some micro cracks which you would see only under a microscope. One of the traces from the keyboard port is visually interrupted, but the other one looks fine. However, if I measure the continuity, there is nothing. The cracks in some traces are so tiny that I can't see them. That's why it is important to test the traces before and also after the rework. So how to fix this? Everybody has his own tricks, I guess. A lot of people go directly with bodge wires. But I don't like how they look like and prefer to restore the traces in a more discreet way. First of all, I add some flux and solder to tin the copper which remained from the traces. I use a piece of thin wire to recreate the traces. You can take such wires, for example from an old IDE ribbon cable or buy such a wire spool. In this case the traces are damaged around the solder joints, so I bend a short piece of wire which I push into the hole, so the end aligns with the broken trace. And now I go over it with a blob of solder once again. Since the trace was previously tinned, it is a very easy step, which I repeat for all of the broken traces. On the other side, where the trace is broken in the middle, far away from any wire, the way to go is very similar. Add some flux tin the clean copper trace and add a wire. First fix it on the one end and then on the other. You can use a pair of tweezers or your finger to keep the wire in place. Since it is so thin, you will not burn your fingers, don't worry. Well, and sometimes you will need a couple of tries, since the damaged traces can be too thin after the oxidation, so you would need to clean up a longer piece of copper to get enough area where you could solder a wire onto. Here the procedure is again the same, but in this case the trace makes a curve, and in such cases you can either bend the wire in shape you need before you solder it, or like I do in this case, first solder one end of the wire to one side, then bend the wire with a pair of tweezers in shape and then solder the other side. The excessive parts can be cut off with pliers. The damage on this board turned out to be bigger than expected. A lot of micro cracks in the traces and especially defects like this one were very annoying. 
You usually try to measure the continuity from one joint to another, and then you waste a lot of time tracing the connections, not understanding why there is no contact, and then realize under a magnifying glass that a trace ends shortly before the solder joint on both sides. Well, but after a while I had all broken traces fixed and the keyboard was again connected to the controller. Since the battery is usually located near the keyboard port, such a damage is very common, and I showed it already in a couple of other repair videos. The restored traces with a solder wire are weakened and could be ripped off easily, so to give it a little bit more stability I always cover such places with some nail varnish, which I initially have stolen from my wife. But as she realized it, the robbery was turned into a graceful donation. The old keyboard connector still had a lot of corrosion inside and one of the ground pins on the shield broke off, so I'll install a new one. These ones are all plastic, but absolutely new. So this board is ready for some tests. As you see it has two square sockets here. The bigger one is for the CPU and the smaller one on the right is for an FPU. Let's see. The CPU is going to be the AMD AM386DX40. And here I have also a fitting FPU ULSI40 as well. When inserting the CPU, don't forget about the orientation. The old CPUs had no alignment key and it is an easy task to burn the CPU or even the mainboard. On the CPU there is uh, this dot in the corner and on the sockets one corner looks differently, as you probably see. This is what the dot on the CPU has to be aligned with. Some ICs have no dot, like this ULSI FPU. Then you have to find a cut corner and align it with the filled corner of the socket. This CPU and the FPU pair supports 40 MHz. And the cool thing about this board is that it has a variable clock generator. Many mainboards of that age had such crystal oscillator which could provide constant clock only and had to be replaced together with the CPU. But on this board to switch the CPU clock we just have to readjust some jumpers. The generator has to run with the doubled frequency of the CPU clock. We have a 40 MHz CPU so the generator has to run at 80 MHz. And as you see both jumpers JP7 and JP8 must be left open. I guess CL stands for closed and OP stands for opened. And as you see the jumpers are already open and the generator should give us the required 80 MHz. So what else would we need for the first analysis? The ISA postcode analyzer is a good tool to have at hand when working with such an old hardware. 
By the way, if the cards are without a bracket, it is very easy to put them into the slot the wrong way around. If you do this, you will get plus 12 volts onto the address bus and burn the card instantly. Remember, ISA cards are always going face up and PCI cards face down. We will need a PC speaker as well to hear if there are any post beep codes. Okay, let's see if it is still alive. Okay, repeating three beep codes. On the AMI BIOS that means missing memory, so let's add some memory. This is an interesting topic by the way. If you saw 286 and 386SX mainboards, maybe you noticed that they usually have less SIM slots mostly four, and you always have to populate two memory modules at a time. Why is it necessary? Well, 286 is a 16-bit CPU with a 16-bit memory bus, but each 30-pin SIM has 8-bit data bus, so you need two SIMs to get to 16-bit, one module for lower 8-bit and one module for the higher 8-bit. The 386SX is a 32-bit CPU, but with cost-reduced 16-bit memory bus. The 386SX performs clock-for-clock clock usually even a bit slower than a 286, but the point is that it needed the memory modules to come in pairs as well. But this mainboard, which I'm trying to revive, is a 386DX, the first real 32-bit CPU with full 32-bit memory bandwidth. That's why on such boards, four memory modules had to be populated at a time. 8 bit times 4 makes 32 bit. That is why on 386DX and 486 mainboards, there were usually more 30 pin SIM slots than on a 286 or 386SX. Here I have 4 times 1 megabyte SIMs. For testing, this would be enough, but uh, theoretically I could use up to 8 SIMs with 1 or 4 MB each, getting this board to 32 MB of RAM. In the early 90s, that would probably cost as much as a new car. And we have one long and eight short beeps, that means that the graphics adapter is missing. There are also some strange beeping sounds afterwards. But currently I can't tell what this means, but let's add a VGA card. And we have a memory count in ticks, and this board seems to be alive. Let's connect it to the monitor and keyboard and see if we will get into the BIOS. And there is a video signal. There are some BIOS settings errors due to the missing battery. Yes, the keyboard seems to work too, I can navigate in BIOS. That means that my traces restoration work was not too bad. Hmm, this option is interesting. Maybe you remember I made once a video about an amazing 386 PC which I built, where I used a Sarek CPU as an upgrade. There I had to use a special software to enable internal CPU cache. And in this BIOS the option seems to be directly included. How exciting! Ok, let's add an IDE controller with a compact flashcard to see if we can boot into DOS. Something's wrong, it seems not to detect the IDE controller or the compact flashcard. Furthermore, I get a message about bad cache memory. Strange. And I found the error. Just entered 17 heads instead of 16. This should be the right geometry for my compact flashcards. Let's try again. 
There is still a message about the bad cash. But the good news is that the system could boot into DOS. System information says that 386DX at 40 MHz and a math coprocessor is present. Wow, but the CPU speed is really low. I would say the cache is not working indeed. It should be about 4 times as fast. Here are the cache ICs, 4 times 32 k and 1 32K tag. Before I dig deeper, let's just remove the cache and try out another ICs which I know are working. Maybe remember, I decided not to remove these sockets, but especially the first one was oxidized a little bit, so maybe there is a broken trace below. Also from the other side, as you see the solder joints of the first socket are not quite as shiny as the other ones. Let's first add some contact cleaner, uh, this is always a good idea. Here I have some UMC32K SRAM ICs, 25 nanoseconds, these are not quite as fast as the 15 nanoseconds ones, which were used in this board originally, but for the test it should be good enough. Yay, that's good news! 128k of cache detected and the error disappeared. Let's take a short look into sysinfo once again. Almost 40 points now instead of 12 as before. That looks now a lot better and the cache is definitely working. This means that the mainboard itself is ok and there are some defective cache ICs. I will now replace the working SRAM ICs one by one with the original ones until we find the culprit. Let's try to change the tag chip first. Still working. Ok, now let's do divide and conquer principle and change the right to ICs. Still working. 128k cache detected. Fine. Now the left two ICs. Yep, at least one of the last two ICs has to be defective. Let's change the right one first. And I would say we have the culprit. The board reports 128k of cache and one IC is obviously defective indeed. Let's give it a last chance and clean the pins once again. As I said, one of the sockets were slightly corroded and maybe there is still some corrosion on the pins of the IC. Nope, this chip is definitely bad. I looked into my spare parts and found the same SRAM IC. And funny enough, they were made in almost the same date. The original one was made 1993 in the week 41 
and the AC from my spare box was made just one week earlier, in 1993 week 40. What an incredible accident! And with the replacement I see the board is totally working and reports now 128k of cash. I made some tests in the background and even Doom is running. It is a slideshow on the 3D6, but it is running. I didn't play around with the BIOS settings yet, so they are quite conservative. And the result was at over 11,000 ticks. This means 6.8 FPS. Let's call it unplayable. But there is something else I would like to try with this board. As I said in the BIOS, it has that Cyrix internal cache option, uh, which theoretically should make it possible to run a 486 DLC CPU at the full speed without additional software, like it was needed on my amazing 386 build video last year. Let's replace the 386DX40 with a TX486 DLC40 and see if we will get some improvements. I wanted to enter the BIOS, but wasn't fast enough pressing delete on the keyboard, so the board started to boot. And as you see, it even properly detected the CPU already, Cyrix 486 DLC. Ok, since the system booted already, let's take a look into CZinfo and once again see the benchmark results. Also here we see Cyrix 486 at 40MHz. And the benchmark didn't change much. It went up from 39 to 43 points, that is about 10%. Ok, let's reboot into BIOS and set the option to enable the internal CPU cache. As you see, the external level 2 cache is enabled. Uh, that are those SRAM ICs which I was fighting with. And now the level 1 cache in the CPU should be active as well as far as I understand. Ok, back in sysinfo. Still the same Cyrix 486 here, nothing has changed so far. And yes, the index went up to over 63 points. That is over 60% faster compared to the 386DX40. Very cool. Well, if you tinker with the hardware of this age, you probably know that Doom is not really playable on a 386, even on DX40. And even if Cyrix 486 DLC is 60% faster, this system is still too slow to deliver a playable frame rate. You probably would be able to play it if you so desperately want to, but you need at least a real 486DX266 to have a real fun with this game. Anyway, the benchmark could be finished with 7900 ticks, this is around 9.5 FPS, still very low, but the good news is that this board is absolutely stable. It is a really nice board, I love its compact size, really cute. In the future I could play with BIOS settings to get some more performance out of it. The ULSI FPU is good, but not the fastest, I could replace it for example with the Cyrix FastMath. If you are interested in seeing the benchmarks of various 386 coprocessors, watch the channel of Atheotis, he made a great comparison. Also CPU Galaxy made a lot of great videos about such things. Now let's summarize. This board suffered from some sneaky battery damage. One cache IC was defected, I ended up with two ICs from 9342 and two from 9340. I could change only one, but I decided to stay in pairs for no obvious reason. The corrosion has been fixed. I restored some traces using a thin wire and covered the spots with some nail varnish. The keyboard connector is new. On the back a lot of rework has been done, but you barely can see it. Uh, that's why I try to avoid botch wires and restore the traces as I showed it. What else? I will definitely upgrade the memory to 8 MB and it will be a nice board for experiments and hardware tests, because it takes so little space on the workbench. And I hope you enjoyed this repair once again. Please don't forget your feedback and join me soon in the next part of this repairathon. And so far, thank you and goodbye.